Um, I started doing and looking into alternative therapies about maybe eight years ago. Um, the reason I did that is because I found um, personally there's always for me uh, there's a reason that I'm going through physically um, that makes me kind of learn. That's just the way the universe has presented it to me that something I'm going through makes me go and look into other modes of therapy. I practice on my animals and then I share it. I can share it with everybody. And now what's happening over the years is that it happens to me and I go, oh, I know why this is happening. Now I know why I got, you know, lung infections and stuff like that so I can learn about <coughs> different modalities. But then, you know, I go, okay, so this is how I'm going to share it with everybody. So, you know, when, when you all are faced with physical challenges and trying to overcome things in your life, because you have animals, and my firm belief is that animals, the, the spirit of the animals and the spirit of you made a pact before you guys came here, you know, and, and the animal says to you, this is because that's the world I live in, because the animal spirit says to your spirit, okay, when we get there on earth, uh, I'm going to teach you this, and your spirit goes, yep, and I'm going to teach you this. And that's the way it is with animals and humans, you know, whether you realize it or not, you learn, and we talked about that just briefly, you learn a tremendous amount from your animal, but your animal and their spirit is also learning a lot from you. So when somebody crosses over, one of you guys crosses over, that spirit kind of gets fortified and gets stronger. You know, so when they come back the next time around, whatever form they come back, and I never believed in reincarnation until I started talking to animals and dead animals, when they come back, you know, it's all of a sudden they get more energy from it. So um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is energy-based because um, we communicate with animals through our energy and everything we do, everything we say, everything we feel has energy. Um, our positive thoughts have a positive form of energy. Negative thoughts have a different form. Negative thoughts and negative emotions, negative reactions have a little bit more debilitating form where they kind of start chopping your energy down. So um, I started looking at different modalities and I don't remember what stage of physical challenges I was in, but one of the first things that I started um, to study years ago, probably about eight, nine years ago, was Reiki. And I believe it happened because I was at a spa, <laughs> okay, and I had a Reiki treatment from somebody. I never had this, and I thought, oh, it's a form of massage. Well, it's not. Does anybody know what Reiki is? Okay, does anybody practice Reiki? Anybody certified in Reiki? You're, you are, what degree are you? Reiki one. Reiki one. Anybody else? Who is? Reiki 2. Reiki 2. Anybody else? Okay, well, Reiki is really a transference <coughs> of energy. And it's not like you're using your own energy. The belief behind it, it was, um, and there's one specific form of Reiki I'm going to talk about today, which is called the Asui form of Reiki, is um, the belief is that the energy is channeled through to you. Now, if you're working with another person, oh, there's a dog under there. <laughs> you see how nice? Um, my belief is that, you know, if you use your own energy for hearing, you, healing, you're going to drain. So Reiki is really, to do it properly, you've got to be channeling that energy through from the higher source, you know, and then, therefore, you're kind of applying it to different points as to where your hands are guided. Now, in the Asui Reiki method, there are different positions. I have been, I guess, and you have to be attuned when you do Reiki. The belief is that you receive this, this you know, ability to channel this energy through um, if you're attuned from a master. And a master has to go through all these different processes of learning. And then when a master is attuned, they can start teaching and they can start attuning other students. So because of my educational system, I think I probably have been attuned seven or eight times by at least three or four different teachers. And they don't all teach the same type of Reiki. And I'll go through the whole bunch of different types of Reiki. But um, and I was looking at my book of certificates, and I, I don't even know what some of these forms of Reiki were. You know, but I just knew there was a different type. One of the things that is really great about Reiki and applying energy, um, the energy is, or, and we'll talk about energy in Qigong also, but energy is kind of like your life force. And if your energy is unbalanced, like it usually is with animals, because they're sucking in energy from us, you know, because we're stressed out, they're getting that, they're absorbing that, it's important to calm them, to calm the energy out so that the animal calms down. 
Tammy and I went out to the, um, uh, the ape sanctuary and we're actually working with, do you remember, Tammy, what kind of ape? He had a, what is it, multiple sclerosis, multiple dystrophy or something like that. He had a, a muscular disease. I don't remember the ape that we're working with. So um, Tammy and I were both kind of working with this ape who had neurological issues. And within minutes, and it's great because, you know, his, al his balance is open. He's open to the environment and everything that goes on. Within minutes, we had him totally falling asleep. You know, there's different types of Reiki. On a Reiki one, traditionally, it's a hands-on where you're actually, there's different positions in the body that you're working on. You're actually touching, um, you know, wherever Reiki needs to be sent to that part of the body. On a Reiki two, a human level, you can do it distance-wise. Um, so I went up to a two. I, I got a, a bunch of degrees on a two, but I didn't see a need to go on anymore because I don't want to be attuning people. That's not where my calling is. Um, but on a Reiki 2, she could be on the other side of the room and be sending energy over because she's balanced and she's calm. She's got the, the body language down pat. Um, that animal on the other side, because she's specifically tuning into his frequency, is going to start showing and responding to what she's doing. So um, that's a little bit about Reiki. Um, let me just see, do I? Um, it will and can affect you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, the sensations that the recipient of a Reiki treatment gets, the sensations are they can either feel heat or cold from your hands. It could be either one. Uh, a vibration, sometimes they feel a vibration. Heaviness, tingling. Um, and usually a typical Reiki session can go Half, a half an hour to an hour, like a good session, is usually an hour. Now, I did a lot of this when I was volunteering in different sanctuaries, and you've got hundreds of animals out there. You don't have an hour with each animal. So I've kind of like whittled it down to 15 minutes, and I was able to do 15 minutes, like one, two, three, bam. Now, the thing with any kind of energy work, Reiki work or um, Qigong work, I'm going to take this off because everybody knows who I am. Um, is different animal breeds and species respond differently to energy. So you really have to be careful how you thrust it. I mean, you may say, well, I don't feel anything, but your animals feel something. Um, different types of Reiki, so I'll just give you different kinds. There's Tibetan Reiki, ancient Egyptian Reiki, angelic Reiki, Karuna, Kundalini, Crystal Dragon, Genda, Ren, uh, Rainbow, Imara, Tumo, Hypno, Sacred Flames, Violet Flame, Fire Serpent, Celtic, Pyramid Money Reiki, and Abundance Pyramid Reiki. So there's like, and every year there's a new form of Reiki that seems to come out. So I kind of went, you know, with the, the traditional Usui method, which is named after um, Usui, Masuro Usui, I think was his name, the founder of it back in the 1900s, and that's, that's the way that I go through. Um, there's different, in Reiki, there's different symbols that you can make, and they make you kind of memorize different symbols, mean different things. For example, there's this one uh, symbol called Sehiki. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Reiki people? No? Okay. Sehiki is a, a symbol, you know, it's got a couple strokes on it. And when you're studying Reiki, they make you memorize this and write it with your hand, write it with a pen. Um, it's, a, it's a symbol for calmness, for mental calmness. And I remember I was, I was volunteering at Judy's, at Pet Rescue by Judy. Have anybody been there? Anybody, you, anybody been there, Judy's? Okay. Anybody else on this side? Okay, well, energy's up and through the roof, and it's always incoming, incoming, incoming. So I was working, um, they asked me to work with a chihuahua that was placed in a crate and hadn't come out for two whole days. It was terrified. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, animal communication, that's not really working because he's going, are you kidding? You're crazy. I am not moving. And it's this, you know, I'm not moving. I'm not getting out of this crate. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I was trained in this Reiki thing, so I'm going to start doing it. So I started doing the symbol for mental calmness. Within seconds, this little chihuahua baby comes out of the crate, and he's fine. They're like, how did you do that? I go, I don't know. So, you know, the thing is, and the thing with a lot of these modalities is validation. You know, if you do something and it's validated with a, an occurrence really soon, you know, most likely you're on the right path. 
And a lot of it too is believing in yourself and trusting that what you're doing is the right thing to do. Um, long distance, okay, if you learn Reiki and you, you're dealing with rescues, how many in here are working with rescue organizations? I know you guys are. Okay, especially wild animal rescues. Um, wild animals like feral cats are even more, more sensitive to uh, Reiki and Qigong and all that kind of energy. But if you're dealing with an animal that you haven't seen and he's across the field or he's in a pasture or whatever, if you've been attuned to be a Reiki too, then you can, you can transmit your energy. I always work my thoughts in with that now, but I used to just transmit my energy. And you know what, they get it. And you could see different body reactions across the field. You could be all the way on the other side of the pasture, you know, wild animals that you're working with, and all of a sudden you go, you know, that leopard is pretty calm now. It's just kind of like settling back and, and easing out. So these energetic modalities really come in hand, handy when you're doing um, any kind of rescue work. Okay, are there any uh, questions on Reiki so far? Because I'm going to move on to Chagong. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've always heard of Reiki, never really, I knew I had to do with energy. Uh -huh. Can you give an example, show what you actually did to make that? Well, it's something it's similar to what Tammy's doing. She's just calm. She's just projecting, you know, her energy. Um, we, we can just do a quick exercise. We'll give you a sense of that. Everybody puts up their hands for one second here. Okay, rub your hands together really quick. Just rub them together. Okay, now let it go. Hold your hands out like this. Put your fingers together if you can. You feel your palms throbbing a little bit, pulsating? Okay, that's a sense of the energy that you feel when you give Reiki out, okay? That pulsating feeling that you have, they're receiving that, okay? You can hang on to it or whatever, <laughs> or you can just let it go if you want. Um, on, on when you're doing Reiki, and Julie, you've used Reiki a lot with your dogs, um, when you're putting your hand on, you got that energy going in. And Reiki is kind of like summoning in that kind of energy and just it just happens. You know, I don't know whether it's because you've been attuned, like they say, or whatever, I just do it. Um, but it just, all of a sudden, it just flows. This last year was a tough year for me physically, but also for one of our dogs. Um, we were modeling our house. I moved out because I became severely allergic to the mold and I took one of our mini dachshunds with us. Um, she was sleeping on the bed, fell off the bed on the hardwood floor and broke her neck. And three vertebrae had to be removed from her neck. Uh, now, I am a firm believer that all these modalities I'm going to speak about today are just extremely beneficial to your animals. Sometimes they stand alone, but most of the times done in conjunction with Western medicine. Now, what I did was she was totally freaked out. This was before we had the surgery, and we were like a couple days going, oh, my God, maybe she'll get better, because we didn't know how bad it was. Um, but as soon as I did the Reiki, she would, she would crawl over because she couldn't stand up because her neck was broken. She could barely walk. She started dragging her back legs. It was getting slightly paralyzed on one side. And she'd come over, and she'd just, please, can you do this? And I would do it, and it would calm her down. And she would instantly, she'd just feel that. It's, it's the type of energy that's given out. She'd feel it. She'd relax it. Unfortunately, because it was so severe that, you know, a lot of them don't survive this, but it was so severe with her that, you know, we had to take her in through surgery. But thereafter, thereafter, we just did Reiki, you know, and she was living with just her and me and the two cats. So I had plenty of time to deal with her issues that she was going through, and it helped her. It helped her get through it, because every time she started tensing up, either I would know at this point just by looking at her and go, gotcha, you know, and I come over because she couldn't move around for six weeks. She was totally crated. Um, it helped. It helped to do the Reiki and it would calm her down so she wasn't stressing and tensing up. Are there any other questions? Yes? Yeah, um, you actually put your hands on the dog? Me? I don't. Um, well, yes, a, a Reiki 2 is supposed to do that. I have just found that with me and my energy, it works better for me to hover. So usually I'm hovering you know, right above them. I don't actually put my hands on them. I personally just feel, I think it's a matter of your, your belief, feel that my energy is stronger when I'm hovering. Once I get on them, it feels like our energy is blending and I don't want it to blend. I just want to give it more than blend with it. Uh, I'm going to segue to medical Qigong and Qigong. 
Um, how many of you are familiar with Qigong for healing? Anybody? Yay, Michelle. One person? <coughs> Did you almost raise your hand or just? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, Qigong is actually, um, as Reiki is Japanese, Qigong is Chinese in origin, it's got a 4,000 year history. Um, and Qigong is really, um, it's a method of coordinating your breath along with your movement. Um, so it's kind of combining the two, and through that you open up your chi or your energy. Okay, chi and energy are kind of, you know, go hand in hand. Um, so in doing qigong, not medical qigong, in doing just qigong, there's a series of exercises that you do, kind of to loosen up, you know, your body and just let it flow. Um, when your chi is blocked, okay, the Chinese believe in meridians. Those that have done, have done acupuncture, who's done acupuncture? Okay, good, 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 okay. So you know how the, um, your acupuncturist works along meridians? Okay, the meridians, the Chinese have a belief that the meridians, each meridian operates a different channel of chi or energy in your body that regulates your organs, that regulates your spiritual, your emotional, your physical well-being. Um, so everything is connected. Okay, so I kind of took my, my way of, of learning, which is, um, you know, I study and a lot of researchers and, you know, find things that people talk about or of alternative healing. And I studied medical Qigong because it's taking Qigong a step further. Now, medical Qigong is also as old as Qigong. Okay, medical Qigong is almost applying um, the theory of Reiki, which is generating your energy, but now you're applying it to the meridians. Okay, which is like an acupuncture. So instead of, and I found this extremely helpful working with animals, because instead of just in Reiki, you're putting your different hand positions and different parts of the body, now you have Qigong and you have medical Qigong. Now you're applying that energy to different meridians that flow through your body. Okay, so it, it, it has its great advantages. You have to just learn what each meridian does and what it's connected to, what system it's connected to, and then you'll find that one system is connected to the other system, so on and so on. And it's just basically your energy is now flowing and it's flowing along you know, a certain channel. When you open up or un unblock those channels, again, the Chinese belief is, and I've seen this with, with animals, um, is that it opens up other systems and other organs and diseases within your body. And we were working on um, some horses, and actually there was one particular blind horse. Now, when you have an animal that is either deaf or is blind, it's really, it's so interesting to work with them because their energy level is so much more sensitive to everything, and it's, it's fabulous. Because when you think about it, you know, someone that is blind and can't see, they have to compensate with their hearing, with their feeling. So the same for animals, and animals are so much more sensitive to energy and what's going on than people are. So when you take an animal that is blind, like a horse, for example, and then you start working energy, um, it was absolutely amazing. We were standing about six or seven feet away from the horse, and it was because she was still a little bit unsure of who was in the pasture, what's going to happen to her. And um, I just started doing the medical Qigong movements around her meridians, following up her cheek, up around her ear, down her neck, down her back. And as I'm doing that six or seven feet away, her body, her skin is rippling exactly to where I'm directing my energy. So all these kind of modalities can come in handy when you're working with you know, animals that are wild or animals you're not familiar with or even your own animal. You know, if you've got an animal that is sick and is not able to move around, you know, and you can't flip them over or you can't move them around, then you can project. You can project your energy just like you do with, with Reiki. Um, is there any, are there any questions on Qigong? Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Uh, we're actually offering a medical Qigong course um, first week, no, second week in February if anybody is interested, um, and that is strictly on meridians. So then I took the theory of, okay, so now we're, we're talking, we're dealing with Reiki, we're dealing with energy, we're talking about Qigong. So I took a little bit step further. I've been receiving biofeedback for years and years and years. Anybody get biofeedback? You do? Okay. 
That's a figure because you're an energy person. Anybody else over here? Over here? Over here? Ah, Michelle, yes. Okay, so biofeedback is basically it's a software program that usually the, um, the person that uses it uses on their computer. And you either can or cannot be in the room, but usually they hook you up, your arms, your legs, and your head is connected to the software. And the software begins to scan thousands of layers within your, your body. And it tells you emotionally, you know, blah, blah, physically, organs, muscles, and so on. Okay, so I actually found a program that does medical qigong that's long distance. You don't have to be in the room. And if anybody's done a session with me, like Michelle or somebody else, you know that I don't necessarily, I'm an intuitive, I don't need to have the animal here in front. Okay, I'm, I'm working remotely. Okay, so if you're working remotely, I contact them through the eyes in the photo. Okay, I project over and I'm kind of there. So it's kind of the same thing as this program works and biofeedback works. Um, is you're kind of operating on a like on a wavelength of energy, you know, where you call, you make a phone call with somebody like a cell phone call, and you go, well, I don't know. Well, you, now everybody's just doing it. I call you, you pick up, hello, right? Well, you're not connected by a wire. It's intention and it's frequencies and it's energy. So I've done the same thing. You know, I found this program and it works really good. Um, Julie, you, I did a session with you and Sco. Can you just talk a little bit about what went through, what happened with Sco after I did that? I, had, I have a 15, 16 year old Shih Tzu who's just had one issue after another. And after I heard her teeth clean last year, she just couldn't eat anymore, she couldn't work, she you know, walk, she was just losing it, losing weight, getting weaker and weaker. Um, I contacted Joe, Joe spoke to her now. Joe never met her, didn't even know she existed. I just gave her her basic information and sent her a photo about an hour before she ran the program. She didn't know about all of her issues, which I knew about, purposely held it from her, except for her mouth issue. Joe's running the program, she's like, she has a kidney issue. Well, yeah, she had kidney failure for three years. She has a, a pelvic bone issue. She had a crushed pelvic bone when she was rescued. She has this with this leg, this with that leg, and she knew exactly which leg went out this way, which leg went this way. It was amazing. And then after the program was done, after she had this whole laundry list of the issues wrong with her, the program cleared the meridians and cleared the energy. This dog hadn't eaten. I mean, I was force feeding her for two, three weeks. It was like barely could get a morsel in her. She got up, walked into the kitchen, ate a whole bowl of kibble, and that went on for like a week, which was amazing. Now, we also, I worked on a cat, because um, not all situations are like that. Um, where you know your your patient, your client is going to come out of it, and they're all perfectly fine. I also I had a cat um, not too long ago. His name was Toby. He's up on my website, and Toby had not come out of the closet for days. Um, and the owner sent me a picture of Toby, just like Julie sent me a picture of, of her dog Sco. And um, I can tell, I you know I mean anybody else probably would said the cat looks really sick, but. I'm looking at him through the eyes. I'm going, well, okay, he's ready to check out now. I know he's ready to check out, but he still had an agenda list. Okay, so by an agenda list is sometimes before they cross over, there's certain things that they want to accomplish. It's kind of their bucket list, but it's usually their bucket list for you. So I want to do this, I want to do that. So I got, okay, you know, he wanted to take a walk in the sunshine, you know, he wanted her to feed him boiled chicken and water. Uh, and we had a couple other things and I ran the program on him the next day. She emails me, oh my God, I think you saved him, you know, because he was, he was dying. The, the vet said, put him down, but he wasn't ready to be put down. Um, so that, that's, that's the whole thing, you know, sometimes they, you know, they just go, wait, I got a couple more things I got to do here. You know, and, and I think that's, I get a lot of that, should I put my dog down, should I put my cat down? It's never really up to you. Uh, it's really between them and the creator, you know, and that's when they decide when they want to go. So um, we had a terrific, we had a terrific turnaround. Well, someone's trying to come in and just go, I don't think so. I was very calm. I was getting almost a massage and Mikhail was like, well, what's the matter with you? Why are you doing that? <laughs> so we got a whole thing going on with the Huskies. And Huskies have a different kind of energy. These guys were very chilled. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> she's good. They're good. They're good over there. 
And so these guys woke up. These guys woke up. You know, I bet you guys didn't even know there were dogs over here because everybody's so quiet and they're all passed out. Um, so, and I think we did a little, we did the program a little bit on, on Hazel too, um, which was a different type of program. So the program that I use that is based on medical Qigong scans on a little bit, a few thousand things more than the biofeedback program does. And it does the same thing. It checks for imbalances in energy. And that's how I knew what was wrong with her dog because it, it tells me energetically imbalances in these organs, in the skin, emotional. It does um, meridians, does a whole bunch of stuff. All right, so I am now going to segue. Uh, and I'm going to talk about shamanism. Is anybody familiar with shamanism? Taking a journey? I don't mean to the grocery store. I don't mean your vacation. Meditating. Who meditates? One, two, three. Okay. Anybody else on this side meditate? You're meditating. I told you to. Yeah, right. Well. <laughs> okay. So shamanism and how can it help with alternative healing and alternative um, healing modalities? Um, it is probably one of the most ancient forms of healing. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about, you know, the village healer, the elder, um, the medicine woman, the medicine man, they were the traditional shamans, you know, who had all the energies of how to heal with herbs, how to heal, you know, with energy, how to heal with other things. Um, the shamans kind of, today's shamans, have taken this kind of to the next level. So, you know, we're kind of using all the modalities that we talked about because we have to. You know, we can't be doing smoke signals and stuff like that. That's that's just not cool. And it was actually it originated in Siberia. Um, you can just take a seat over there. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Anywhere you feel comfortable is good. That's good. She's fine. Um, so that's kind of like today's shaman, you know. And it's really interesting if you look up the word wizard, you know, and you think of magicians and spells and stuff like that. Well, you know, when you really look into the origin of wizardry and shamans, um, they're actually, you know, there's, there's a big crossover because shamans are there to heal people. Now there's shamans that are there just to heal animals. Now my belief is that by addressing the animal, you're addressing the person that's attached to the animal. So if, you know, you're, you're looking to do something shamanically, um, shamans will drive out negative energies. They do it with various things. Um, they will bring in your guides. You know, the belief is that everybody has either angel, guardian angels, or guides that work with them. Um, there are guides that give you more strength. There are guides that, you know, make you calm. Um, I, when I first started studying shamanism years ago, um, I, you know, you started by doing a journey. And a journey is actually a um, controlled meditation. And by controlled, I mean you go into this meditation or journey with a question or a quest. You know, and you go in saying, I want to know what can I do to help his cancer. So you go in and each shaman has a belief that they have at least one, if not more than one, power animals or guides that work with them and give them strength and guidance. So when you go in through this med meditative journey, um, you have this protection, this element of protection, but also the guidance. So different worlds exist in this, the lower world, which is actually your nature world, the middle world and the upper world. The upper world can be, you know, angels, um, heaven, and so on. And there's, there's different, there's, it's almost like being Alice in Wonderland. You know, you go through the porthole and all of a sudden you're in this different world and there's your guides. And then you meet your guides and, and you say, you know, what do I do, you know, to help his cancer? And a specific guy comes up to you and says, this is what you do. So that's an extreme example. Um, Sabina and Tammy, you guys have done journeys. What, what, Sabina, what have you done journeys for, for your animals? Um, body scanning, trying to find out if they, when they have an illness, where the illness may have been located, because you can go down to the layer of the, under the skin, the flesh, the bone, internal. It's really fascinating what you actually can find out. I've also worked with other people's animals to help them, you know, and it is not me that does that. I have a shaman that does the healing for me, but I'm with him. And you find something, you make sure you get rid of it, and you replace it 
with pure white energy. It's really, really neat work. Tammy, what have you gone and done a journey for with the animals? It was uh, working with somebody else's animal, mm -hmm. um, like Sabine with, with the shaman, mm -hmm. um, just trying to see what was going on with the animal and how it could be corrected. And, and you kind of, depending on what you're allowed to see, mm -hmm. you may see the healing going on or you may sense it. Right. It just depends on what what's taking place and what's being allowed. Right. Like, it was to search out and find what was wrong with the other animal. Right. It's really, it's more of your, um, you know, your ancient tribal kind of ways of thinking and dealing where you're, you know, it m maybe extracting ne negative energy um, if you think that's a part of it or sometimes shamans will extract, you know, the, the disease that's going on. Um, can you give any examples specifically? Mine was more like, mine I wasn't allowed to see because then I want to do something <coughs> in my background. And so it almost, the setting to me almost looked like a sterile white operating room. All I could see was white. I could tell what was going on, mm -hmm. but it was like as if they were working in an operating room. It was all white and they were removing something. And I could tell when they had removed the source because then it filled with white light and everything whited out. And I think each journey is different and it's different for each person. Um, I do medical scanning without going into the journey. I just close my eyes, left hands for scanning, right hands for putting in. And I do it that way, so I don't have to do that. But my journey may be to go to a guide that I have that is a vet and say, I need to know exactly what kind of process I need to deal with here to deal with this particular type of situation. Um, Tammy's is different than Sabina's. And, you know, everybody has different um, experiences, and there's different ways of doing it. And there's different schools of thought. There's a Celtic school of thought. There's a Native American school of thought. So, you know, depending on who you're studying with, um, we do have a class in shamanism that's coming up also in March. Uh, if anybody's interested, or, does anybody have any any questions on um, on shamanism and using that for healing? Uh uh. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of extreme, but you know, if you think of, well. You know, it's, it's a modality to help you with whatever you're doing. So it could be energy healing, uh, it could be Reiki, it could be medical Qigong, it could be shamanism. And then this is my newest, um, my newest <laughs> acquisition of certificates that I've been working with. Um, now, I can tell you that um, in, when I started studying shamanism, it was just, you know, kind of an, an empty void and I was interested in it. And... Um, a lady that was very a very strong shaman who I didn't know of back then uh, was forming a program. She contacted me after I bought a DVD of hers and said, "Would you mind being in my school program? You know, in exchange, you can take any classes and I'll tutor you for free to be a shaman." So I said, "Sure." So it kind of like happened that way. I didn't have anything extreme that happened. Um, when I started looking into essential oils. Um, it was very dramatic, and I think it had to be dramatic because I learned all the other stuff, and I really wanted black and white results from whatever I was going to do next. Um, last year was a very critical time for me where I had a lot of physical challenges. What started out as an allergy ended up with pleurisy, which is, I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, it's an infection of your lungs where there's water in your lungs and it's extremely painful, and it took like almost eight months to get rid of that. Um, during that time, I developed a lot of different issues that went along with that. And, you know, the medical community's out there doing scans and all this stuff, and nobody could find a cure or a help for that. One of the things that happened was that I blacked out and bruised my legs severely. It wasn't even black and blue, it was just black. And I developed a series of lumps underneath it. I did scans, nothing was wrong, you know, I couldn't move, I couldn't sleep on, it was very painful. So. I looked at every modality possible and intuitively I was feeling that essential oils would be, you know, part of what this program would call for. Now, the, I, you know, I've, I've had this program for five years. I've looked into essential oils. There's tons of companies out there and this company kept coming up and up and up and it's called Young Living. Is anybody familiar with that? 
Okay. Okay, so, you know, I'll tell you, you know, what I'm not crazy about with Young Living was that it was kind of not a pyramid thing, but it's like, well, you have to know somebody to get in, and if you sell so much, then, you know, then you get this. And I'm like, I'm not about selling. I'm not about making money off of this. I'm just looking for an oil to help me with my leg. So I got, I signed up, I happened to end up again on somebody's website, and I ended up taking a certification course in essential oils and aromatherapy. And I'll tell you after the second application of using a specific oil called Copa Iba that they sell, I put it on my leg and my black and blue became blue, became normal skin, all the lumps disappeared within two weeks. So I thought, I'm gonna check this out. So I'm going to look into these oils a little bit more. I got tons of stuff going on. I got a dog with a broken neck, you know. <laughs> I'm coughing up a storm. Let me look into these, these oils. So the next oil that I, that I bought was eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is a very good oil for your respiratory system. But I also found another oil called thieves, which um, thieves is very, very strong. And I brought a sampling of a couple of these oils with me. And I started putting one drop of thieves on my tongue whenever I would get horrible coughing spells. Nothing stopped it. I tried every medicine, been to three doctors, ENT specialists, couldn't stop my coughing. One drop of this thing, my coughing stopped. So I'm like, I'm going to keep looking into this. So what was interesting, again, as I'm getting better and I'm using oils and I'm using all this other stuff, and yeah, I'm taking antibiotics because I still have infections and stuff. You know, I got a recurring dog here who's who is recovering from her broken neck. So again, and I got a cat that's sneezing somewhere in the background. So I started diffusing a lot of these oils that you know, I bought, and they're not cheap, you know, which was my other concern. I'm like, okay, well, you know, one little bottle could be like $78, helichrysum, you know, for, for bruising and, and nerve regeneration. It's just 78 bucks for a tiny little bottle like that, so I thought, you know, I'm going to take it easy. So I really stretched out the little kit that I got, and I bought a couple more oils, and I started using it. Um, and my, my little dog, Sydney, with her broken neck, recovered, and she's doing really fantastic. Um, we have retrained her not to jump up on furniture, because that's the key thing. For, this is just an aside for all you guys with dogs that jump up on furniture. The two joints that impact um, the most when they're jumping is shoulders and hips are going to be affected first. So, um, you know, and her putting her weight down affected her neck, okay, jumping up. The dogs, since they're little, all the little dogs jump up, look up, look up, look up. So they're putting a lot of strain on us when they finally fall off the bed or have any kind of trauma to it. That area now is very sensitive. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about essential oils um, and how they differ from herbs because I think that's, that's really kind of interesting. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about different oils. Um, anybody have any questions so far with this? Okay. Um, the essential oil is actually the blood of the plant, and it could come from different parts of the plant. It's not, you know, like it's not flower essence where it comes from the flower or the bud. The, the essential oil is the lifeline of the blood, so just of the plant. So um, just like our blood, is, is for us to make us strong. Essential oils, you know, or the oil of the plant is the lifeline of the plant. Um, now, the process where it differs is the distilling process. Um, you know, and there's, where there's tons of variations and tons of different oils and various different companies. So, you know, you go, well, which one do I pick? You know, how do I know? And I go, well, you know, I know lavender's a nice calming oil. Well, I have lavender at home. Okay, but you know, unless it has a, a, a dark bottle and it has therapeutic grade on there and has, you know, if, if it's a mixed oil, what ingredients are, are on there and it's got, you know, that little certificate that says it's been approved, you don't know, you know, where that lavender came from. I know that with this company, and again, I'm not pitching the company at all, but I know that with this company, they have specific fields that have grown, have been grown specifically just for lavender. And then they go through the distillation process, you know, and then they go through one other process. You know, so it's, it's, it's been scientifically proven. They got tons of studies on different oils, you know, for different things. I have found that the key is knowing which oil to use for what. 
Okay, I know that if I use Thieves and I put Thieves on, Thieves is a very hot oil, okay, topically. Hot meaning it's going to actually feel like it's burning my skin. But if I put a drop of it under my tongue, I'm okay. I put it on my dog's tongue. He's a very sensitive dog and he's throwing up all over the place. So, you know, it also you have to take into account what kind of dog you have, you know, or, or client or patient, whoever's receiving the oil, you know, their, their level of sensitivity with it. Um, Let's see, um, essential oils are not like fatty oils. They're not like vegetable oils. They're not like fatty acids. They're not like olive oil, flax oil, and so on. Uh, fatty oils are pressed from the seeds of the plant, and they are not essential to the life of the plant. Um, so that's basically your difference, you know. People think, oh, you know, well, I have olive oil. Now, olive oil actually is good to um, take the edge off the oil. If the oil is very, very harsh, if you're dealing with an oil that can possibly burn. And actually, that's what you want in a lot of these cases. If you're dealing with a virus, you know, or if you're dealing with bacteria, with fungus, you want an oil that's going to get to work. It's going to be your, I'm going to wipe it out because I'm really, really strong. Um, whereas opposed to, um, you know, the other oils that aren't that strong. Um, if the oil is really, really strong and you want to use it anyway, olive oil is a good oil to kind of blend it in with. So if you have an oil like Thieves, which is good for respiratory, it's an antibacterial, antibiotic, um, antifungal, antiviral. It pretty much covers the whole base. You can't lose if you have this little tiny bottle. And this one I don't think is that expensive. Yes? Uh -huh. T-H-I-E-V-E-S. Uh -huh. uh, it's a combination. Yep, it's a compound. T-H-I-E-V-E-S, thieves. Mm -hmm. Now, another one that's good for the lungs is basil. If anybody has basil, again, be careful how you're applying this. Lungs is, it's also good for your lungs. Um, through this company, they make another one called RC, um, which is, again, Roman chamomile. It's a whole combination. It's a compound of different oils, but that's also another one that's really good for your lungs. I still diffuse because, you know what, if someone throws up or has an accident in the room, I'm diffusing. You know, I have clients coming in my office, I'm diffusing. But I'm also getting rid of all the germs and bacteria um, that's going on with that. Um, four ways that you can use oils. You can um, put them on, on your skin. Um, you can diffuse them if you have a diffuser at home. Uh, you can put them on orally. Um, and then what is the fourth way that they're talking about? Oh, okay, injection, which you need a vet for that. Um, so the three that you as common users would, would do it is diffusing. So you would take spring or purified water into your diffuser and drop four to eight drops of an oil. And if you have lavender, if you think the quality is good, you know, give it a shot and it's going to smell really good. It's going to purify the air. And if it's a really good air oil, then, you know, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, any kind of side effects or anything. Um, now, oils. I'll tell you a little bit about our, our latest um, <laughs> learning lesson at home, our challenge. Our great parentess was diagnosed with cancer um, a couple weeks ago. And on um, one, uh, let's see, two out of millions of other cancers, he's got the two most, one of the two most aggressive cancers there are. So life expectancy, not more than three months. Um, so about, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago when we found out about it, and we went down to Gainesville, you know, we got the oncology consult and all that stuff. I put him on an organic cancer diet, and I started doing um, the essential oils with him. Now, I had to be really careful. Um, these oils, some of these oils are so strong that if you put the wrong kind of oil in the wrong kind of order, it's going to burn. It's going to burn the skin. Uh, and if you have any burns on the skin, um, V6 is another type of oil that you use to calm that skin down right away. Now, unfortunately, this guy's suffering with cancer, and you know, I'm trying to help him with this. He's got a little bit of a staph infection. When I used the V6 oil to calm down the burning feeling, it sealed in the staph, and the staph spread down the spinal column. So you kind of have to know what you're doing and which order to do it, which oils to do it. So if anybody's interested in essential oils, I would definitely, definitely, definitely tell you, you've got to research the right oils in the right order. 
because uh, otherwise you can really, you know, cause a little bit of havoc. Can I ask you guys to talk about your possum, tell them your possum story and essential oils real quick? They run a rescue with wild animals. We have uh, male possum on the release of uh, Just to go back on the story, he was um, struck by a car in the head and um, with surgery, his jaw was rewired back on, but it left permanent. He had a broken pelvis also, which um, left his back end swaggering when he walked and dragging his feet. And uh, he also had suffered some uh, brain injury, which left him a little pump. His mental capacity is lower than they normally be. Possum is not big on and not that you know, keen when it comes to intelligence. Um, anyway, um, he's been with us for over a year now, and he's always been two years. He's been all right, but slow. And uh, lately he's been going downhill. We thought we were coming to the point where we were going to be helping him to go. His quality of life was almost nil. Um, and you have to tell <coughs> the most oil you put on He could not stand up anymore at all. And so for about a month, not standing up. And one of his favorite things to do was to eat and eat his little grapes and berries. And he wasn't doing that. Maybe for about three days. Um, so we decided that's coming on Tuesday, we're going to euthanize him. So I figured, can't, can't hurt, give him a raindrop. Um, and, and a raindrop, what she means by a raindrop, there's a therapy technique um, with these essential oils that if you put certain amounts of oils in a certain meth in a certain system and use a certain massage technique rubbing the oils down his spinal column it'll be absorbed into their their skin and the spinal column is your source for attracting all bacteria and all kinds of issues so that's where you want to put this this raindrop so um i burned some sage we got all the girls that we all love this possum so we, we did a little ceremony burned some sage did the raindrop we also use frankincense on his feet to anoint his feet because it's transitional and going Frankincense also breaks up tumors. Um, so we left him and we were planning on doing it at the end of the day and I got a call from my coworker with a little video of the possum up and, and we, none of us could believe it. Every day he just got better. We were, we kept, so he decided not to use my yeah. like, He looks so happy, he's so alert, I can't believe this. Um, it's been a week now, and just as we were leaving to come here, the same coworker ran over and said he is up and walking around, his ears are up, which his ears were like little dogs, like little the Eeyore, the donkey ears, <laughs> for two and a half years now. His ears were up. Uh, it's a little possum, you know, statue page and have the ears like satellites because they're not going around. And he's actually <coughs> standing on his back feet. His back, his back feet. Yes. And right. also his um for the for the past you know, the three days that he wasn't eating, he was having trouble balancing his front paws. He would push and not be able to pull himself upright. And the one thing I did with raindrops, I added valor, which is balancing. Yeah. And that seems to work. So, I, I Essential oils are very, very strong, and I think when you're up against the wall and like up against really dire circumstances, I think it's very, very important. Um, you know, you just you get all your tools out. You know, you basically get all your guns out. You do whatever you can. Um, this is another oil, basil. This is the basil I was talking about for lungs. It's also good for joints. Um, if anybody here who has arthritis pain or ligament pain, anything like that. If anybody does, if you want to come up afterwards and just rub, take one or two drops, put it in your hands or wherever, shoulders, neck, wherever. This is amazing. Um, if I'm getting any swelling in my hands because I have RA, instantly. This is within maybe five, ten minutes. This particular basil works. It's, it's I'm sorry, uh, basil. basil. Yes. Thieves, this is the one I was talking about. <clears throat> Everything, antiviral, anti, you name it. It does it. It's up here if anybody likes to take a look at that. Yep, on my tongue. Thieves. Thieves. That's right up here. <clears throat> um, this is cypress. Any of your wood oils <clears throat> are good for your arthritis. They're good for your joints. So cypress, um, Idaho balsam fir, you know, there's tons of others. Um, but this is extremely, extremely good. Also, immediate results for if you put it on your joints. 
your ligaments, whatever, you're good to go. RC is also good for your lungs. It's also good for bone spurs, and it's also good for pain. And I brought peppermint with me also. Peppermint, um, each of these oils does a specific function. You know, you have your respiratory oils and all that. One of the things other than great for headaches, um, great for tumors also, peppermint, um, great for digestive system, peppermint, okay? So it's, we brought our peer back from having all his tests, and he was out for two days from the anesthesia, totally out. Horrible. I know he had horrible, horrible headaches. You know, and when the dogs are out, when you guys have to have your dogs taken in for anesthesia, I mean, their their arms, they, you know, the dog's out. So they figure, okay, good. So they're getting twisted like a pretzel. Well, then they wake up and they're, oh my God. You know, he had, a, he had arthritis in his shoulder. You know, he couldn't move his neck and they were twisting his neck around because they were looking for lumps in his lymph nodes. So, you know, they're not gonna feel good. <clears throat> I personally found, because I, I firsthand, um, that this was one of the oils that helped him. I just put a drop on his forehead, because again, he's really sensitive. Valor is another one that I used. You said Valor? Yep, peppermint. Um, Valor was another one for balancing that, you know, that I used on him. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up, um, but if you guys have any questions, you're more than welcome to email me. Uh, you can go on my website. I don't have the essential oils up on the website yet, but I will be posting that up pretty soon. Um, if you want to come up and just smell, you can. Okay, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.